Hi, everybody. I'm Anna Woldrich from the Austrian Academy of Sciences. I'm uh, the host for this session. And before I introduce our session moderator, I'd like to point out as well that we have a Twitter discussion going on. In the back office, Shiro Ino from our Ignite team, as well as a dear colleague of mine, Vanessa Hannes Schläger from ACDH in Vienna. They will be tweeting under the hashtag Ignite uh, Roundtable, as well as under the hashtag <coughs> DHA of 2020. And now let me introduce you to our moderator, Marian Ping Huan, who will be moderating this session. Hi, Marian. Hello, Anna. Good to have you. Nice to be here. May I, may, may I add that Marian is an academic developer with a history of working in the research, teaching and knowledge sharing, and she gathered expertise in leadership and working across disciplines and sectors with arts, creativity and innovation, as well as cultural and creative industries. And currently she's an associate professor, professor at Aarhus University. Good to have you with us, Marian. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Anna, and hello, everybody. Welcome to our for, for, fourth and last Ignite Digital Roundtable on design thinking and maker culture and how we make pathways for sticky learning for the 20th century. The Ignite Roundtables have been held on Wednesday afternoons through April and uh, are hosted by the Ignite Project, which will very soon uh, launch uh, six online courses on design thinking and maker culture, the first of which is already accessible. At the Ignite Roundtables, we have had really great uh, talks and discussions and how digital technologies open up to new teaching approaches uh, and promote uh, new learning spaces uh, and environments for our students. For today's roundtable, we have an extended version with six speakers. Uh, who will present and discuss maker culture and sustainability, story maps and open education, digital oral histories and archival biases, interactive digital narratives, approaches uh, to the creative industries, and design thinking for sustainable fashion. We'll have a very rich uh, session. So for this first part of it with three speakers, we'll restrict the questions and answers a bit to be able to break shortly at five uh, to four, so everybody can grab, grab a fresh coffee or some water and be back for the second part. We will have uh, three brilliant speakers uh, for this first part. Uh, Peter Knobloch from the University of Applied Arts uh, in Vienna, uh, who will speak about uh, maker culture and industrial development uh, for sustainability. Uh, Vladimir Alexi uh, from the University of Niche, uh, who will uh, speak to us about story maps and open education and on the uh, sanitary measures taken in uh, <clears throat> medieval times. Uh, and the last uh, one in this part uh, of the round, round table will be Esther uh, Anim, uh, Aminata Kamara from Maastricht University. Um, so, with uh, no further ado, uh, Peter uh, Knobloch uh, from the University of Applied Arts. Uh, um, I'll leave the screen and the space to you to uh, tell us about your insights on maker culture and industrial development. Please. Hello. Oh, hang on a second. Okay, so can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Yes, everything works out fine. Okay. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Peter Knobloch. I'm teaching industrial design at the University of Applied Arts. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about sustainability today. In 2015, hang on a second. <laughs> In 2015, the EU presented the Sustainable Development Goals, where one of them uh, takes care about responsible consumption and production. 
2015 was a good year in that way because it was the same year where the EU also released the action plan for the circular economy, which was updated just recently last March, updated and extended. So one question that I always ask me is, uh, how are the chances and possibilities and things you have to do to achieve sustainable consumption and production patterns? Many of the products that we use today already have a very long development history. And since there are fundamental laws of, for instance, physics and chemistry, technical boundaries exist. Those boundaries are nasty in a way because they can never be exceeded, only approached and are a limiting, limiting factor for any further development. So for some products, uh, I'm always interested in have those boundaries already been approached. I always like to use a washing machine as, a, as an example. You will see that's one of my strange hobbies later on, um, mainly because it's a politically important product and it's also a very well-known and investigated product. The first washing machine, to my surprise, uh, was presented in 1937 in the United States. So we can look back at 83 years of development. And uh, there is a, um, a study from Germany uh, which investigated the resource requirements uh, of washing machines for, of course, not the full 83 years, but since the 1970s. And uh, I, uh, based on their data, I uh, made them into a chart and you could see that in the mid 90s, those curves flatten out. So that is a strong hint that the uh, technical boundaries have already been approached. This is not really a surprise to me because um, using less energy and less water was always also a selling argument uh, for washing machines. So there was all, always an incentive for producers to uh, incorporate those features. But if you look only at those um, lines, it's only one part of the resource requirements of a, a product because it's only the use phase but basically we have at least three phases, manufacturing, usage, recycling, and disposal. Uh, so one thing you could think of, of course, is okay, let's just uh, focus hard and work hard and let's just chip away a little bit of those resource requirements like this. Um, but as I already said, we already reached the technical boundaries. So there's not a really a lot you can do anymore. And Actually, we don't uh, want to buy a washing machine. We want to buy the usage of a washing machine. Uh, so, the, um, so actually, we need to look at the resource efficiency per use. And that's easily done by just um, adding the gray resource requirements to the use phase. And then, of course, uh, it's very easy to say and see that everything you can do to read further reduce the uh, resource uh, requirements of a washing machine is, or any given product, is to lengthen the use phase. Um, that's also a narrative, of course, and the goal of the circular economy. And the circular economy hints very strongly to the closing of the resource flows, but actually it uh, hints at three parts. And if we uh, look at those three parts separately, it's much clearer to see where we can, uh, where we have a better chance to, uh, for further improvements. So the first uh, little image is just the plain old uh, linear economy uh, with an open resource flow, which is trivial. That's why we did it. Uh, closing the resource flow is really challenging because we have to develop new materials and new material cycles. Um, where it might be easier if we don't think of materials, but components. So we reuse components and rebuild them in, into new products. Uh, another one is minimizing resource requirements. That's the tricky part if, we, if you already are looking at a product with, um, where the technical boundaries have been reached. And the easy part actually is extending the lifespan because uh, everybody has 
some washing machine that already was used for 40 years or something. So we know how to build uh, long living products. And the main trick of the extended lifespan is to distribute the uh, amount for manufacturing, recycling uh, and uh, disposal over the whole use phase. So looking at the design criteria, how to create a long lifespan, um, there are quite a few things you can do. Um, and in general, you can say for a long lifespan of a product, aside to the overall build quality and accessible documentation, availability of spare parts and non-restrictive licensing, licensing, also for the repairs itself is very important. And that's something that's not really uh, quite well available. Um, and that's where sometimes uh, the maker community jumps in. And uh, you've probably heard of iFixit, a company for which for years, starting with iPhones at the beginning, uh, is creating uh, repair manuals by reverse engineering current products. Um, I'm quite uh, well connected to the lo our local uh, maker community because on my, um, aside to my job at the university, I'm co-founder of a small non-profit registered association. We call it Permanere. Um, and the main goal currently, we only have one goal, is to develop a washing machine and find out by developing the washing machine how to build products that are really lasting basically forever. So our product, uh, project is called 100 Jahre Waschmaschine. We never translate this. Um, and here in the image, you can see uh, the experimental setups, number eight until 10. What we do here is we um, take separate functions and investigate them. And at the end, we uh, imagine that we will put them together to a finished washing machine. So uh, talking, being involved in a lot, lot of open hardware meetups and make uh, community talks, I can only have an anecdotal and almost cliche evidence of what is, where's the difference between maker culture and industrial production. And here you can see some bold faced differences. And uh, of course, this is very simplified and none of the um, features is exclusive to either one or the other side. But uh, in my, um, if, I, <laughs> if I start to dream, I say, I would like to have an, an open source uh, device um, with a high agility of development which uses small scale and large scale uh, fabrication mod, uh, methods where the documentation is available and the licensing, licensing is open. Uh, looking at the manufacturing process, because I said small and large scale, we dis uh, decided or oriented us completely our design of the washing machine so that every part can be built either with industrial production methods or by the so-called digital fabrication methods, because the digital fabrication methods uh, enable us to say that we have all the parts that we need, special, uh, especially for that washing machine, to um, uh, store them in a digital spare stock. So we don't have to produce them first, but we can produce them later on at any given time. And since the documentation is open, everybody also can um, evaluate who is knowledgeable enough uh, if the design is good or not. Uh, one other part, I'm almost finished, is the, um, the documentation. Um, the, I just go back for one slide. The self, that, uh, the motivation to build something is highly intrinsic for the makers but the motivation to create documentation, is, that's usually where it's not intrinsic anymore. Um, and so there are a lot of open source hardware products existing which lack documentation. It's compared to the industrial products, not really so troublesome because there are, sometimes you don't have any access at all. But uh, to share some hope, there is a DIN spec which um, should act as a quality label 
for open source hardware project, projects um, where you have the requirements for a technical documentation, so the minimum requirements. So open source hardware with good documentation might be one path to go. Thank you. Thank you so much. So highly interesting um, um, uh, talk. And I think sustainability we will be returning to that uh, at the end of, of this um, uh, uh, round table. Uh, I'll just give you one question. I don't think we have any questions in the chat. But this is so, uh, sort of the other side, the consumption side of the STG uh, uh, 12, uh, how to um, uh, more broadly engage uh, uh, users of, say, washing machines in this. Mm, there is one tricky part uh, because uh, this all circles a little bit about the term premature obsolescence. It's a term that I don't really like because it just eats up time and conversations and doesn't lead you really anywhere. Um, and uh, one tricky thing is that the, as an industrial manufacturer, you always orientate on lowering the, uh, the price for purchasing stuff, but not for the overall price. Mm. Nobody in a commercial application does this, only uh, end consumers. So um, one thing I think that is important is uh, to inform yourself as a consumer. In Austria, you could buy for five euros, I think, the consumer reports. So before you buy, uh, depending on your budget, 300 to 1200 uh, euros washing machine, invest five euros and inform yourself. Mm. Very good advice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'll now uh, invite our uh, second speaker, uh, Vladimir Alexi, from, uh, uh, from University of Nish in Serbia, who's going to share with us uh, how he has been uh, working on story maps uh, and open education in a flipped classroom uh, uh, environment. OK. OK, Vladimir. Uh, thank you for uh, the introduction and uh, greetings again. It's very, I'm very happy to be able to present today my ideas and I'm eager to hear the feedback and suggestions in order to improve my original idea. I slightly uh, change the, the to, uh, case the study that I'm going to present instead of sanitation culture in the medieval city of Dubrovnik and neighboring countries. I'm going to talk today about infectious diseases in the commune of uh, Dubrovnik in the uh, 14th and 15th century. And uh, unfortunately, the topic couldn't be more uh, actual and uh, act, uh, uh, in the uh, highlight of the uh, uh, present society. So uh, this is the main reason uh, why I narrowed the topic. Uh, uh, otherwise, everything uh, remains the same, and uh, it's about uh, story maps and open education in the flipped uh, classroom. And I've been teaching medieval history for the last uh, 20 years, and originally I became interested in story maps uh, due to my uh, long-lasting interest in historical uh, geography, but also I'm keen uh, to learn about medieval uh, culture is also a significant part of my uh, work. And today you're not going to see a classical PowerPoint presentation. Instead, I prepared uh, one story map which uh, should uh, show you the possibilities, uh, uh, open access and uh, easy to learn uh, application uh, uh, can provide uh, in everyday uh, teaching experience. Uh, my objective uh, uh, is to explore the possible ways to use the flipped classroom teaching method in combination with story maps and open education practice in teaching at the university level and promoting medieval culture. Uh, the presentation is aimed for the higher education uh, facilities and uh, roughly uh, it should be uh, 
the topic uh, should be presented uh, during uh, a 90 minute or maybe less a practice uh, a lesson. Uh, uh, this topic belongs to intangible uh, culture, namely sanitary uh, culture or the history of the everyday uh, life. Uh, what uh, my idea makes uh, special, or at least I think, I hope that is special and interesting, and that is new, that is the use, uh, uh, that, is, uh, that we use the power of SG Story Map Cascade to transmit compelling story by merging text with maps, images, and multimedia content in a likable full screen scrolling experience. As you can see, now I'm using a tablet. It was not my option, I was forced to do it, but still uh, it's very easy to uh, uh, navigate through uh, text. text. And of course, uh, 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 the idea, uh, this uh, story map uh, is a half partially uh, presentation for this uh, uh, event today, partially it, uh, shows how one uh, uh, teaching material uh, should uh, look like. And uh, my idea is to uh, uh, present uh, uh, students with uh, uh, these uh, clear instructions. Uh, it provides uh, higher education students with the learning material, uh, methodological instruction, which is very important because it's not just about repeating uh, uh, material, but also understanding uh, why it's so important. Also, it provides uh, students with audiovisual material and uh, topics for thinking in the field of intangible heritage uh, uh, culture. Uh, when dealing with intangible uh, culture, uh, it's always hard to make, to visualize it, to present it. And uh, I believe that the digital humanity uh, 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 modern digital uh, uh, technologies can um, narrow that gap, which is very uh, uh, big, and that gap is actually uh, 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 becoming uh, smaller and smaller. Unlike traditional hangouts or printed textbooks, this form of presenting material allows for visually dynamic and digitally appealing communications. Uh, uh, the material, uh, uh, the source, the material uh, has been drawn from uh, this uh, book, and I will just give you the uh, my English translation. There is no such a, uh, it's my translation. Uh, historical sources for the history of the sanitation culture in uh, Dubrovnik, and you can see it uh, has been printed uh, a long, long time ago in 1938. But uh, still, uh, it is uh, very uh, modern, and uh, uh, and it covers the needs of a contemporary uh, uh, socio sociological history historiography. So, in uh, order to introduce students with uh, uh, the authors of this uh, textbook uh, and or source material, I uh, think uh, I. I give this a short explanation. Uh, what are the teaching objectives? Uh, uh, of course, uh, they are arbitrary, but uh, based on my 20 years experience uh, and uh, my uh, preferences, uh, I would choose uh, the following one, but um, of course, uh, it's, uh, it can be changed. Uh, the focus of our work with students can be uh, could be the legal measures and practical steps which local authorities undertook to fight against the frequently repeated infectious diseases such as paid communal doctors, buildings or hospitals and Lazarus travel bans and uh, etc. Uh, in one of my um, uh, Twitter uh, posts, uh, I emphasized uh, that uh, actually uh, it was uh, that uh, the commune uh, uh, counted more on some practical measures rather than on uh, uh, prayers and uh, uh, church uh, and rituals uh, to protect from uh, this uh, uh, dangerous uh, peril. Uh, also, we want to measure the impact of the above described situation on the overall social development. Uh, People talk about COVID-19, 
because of medical aspects, which in this presentation are completely neglected. I'm not an uh, 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 expert in a medical science, so I, I cannot judge the measures uh, the uh, government of Dubrovnik uh, under, uh, uh, undertook, uh, 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 conducted uh, in the uh, 14th and 15th century, but I can, uh, uh, we can, uh, together with students, we can discuss and we can point uh, the uh, social uh, impact, the, the impact on the social development. Of course, uh, uh, we can uh, discuss the nature of historical sources. For instance, uh, uh, there are uh, uh, diplomatic evidences, uh, uh, which are the main source, and to compare it with narrative uh, sources like old chronicles and. Uh, uh, when compared together, uh, it is obvious that there is uh, uh, some similarities, but also and some some uh, uh, huge uh, differences. Of course, a more topic can emerge. Before uh, diving in into the topic, I believe that uh, as a teacher that I should uh, give some uh, short explanation about the uh, commune of uh, Dubrovnik and. Uh, I will not uh, go through this uh, 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 part of my uh, story map because uh, uh, it is uh, 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 not uh, so uh, uh, connected to uh, uh, the topic of this uh, event today, but still uh, it is good uh, to have it. And here uh, uh, again, uh, because this is the story map, uh, we are uh, meeting uh, with the first uh, map which roughly shows the uh, position of the uh, uh, city of Dubrovnik uh, uh, today. Uh, then there is a short explanation how uh, the Dubrovnik was uh, governed and about social and political uh, uh, structure uh, and uh, again uh, the, uh, we are introducing with first task uh, in this case, uh, I'm uh, urging and uh, directing students to find cases when official uh, decisions were made according to strict social differences in the contemporary society. And then uh, here is uh, one uh, example. Uh, usually, uh, I quote, usually the infected citizens were uh, confined to the small and uh, unhospitable cliffs of Supeter which offered no conditions for regular life. Hence, if a nobleman or a prominent citizen become, uh, becomes ill, the Duke will bring uh, his case to the Senate. It was to, uh, to decide uh, on the special measures to be taken uh, to cure him. And uh, in according with the previous text, uh, there is a small uh, map embedded in uh, 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 bigger screen uh, which uh, indicated the position of uh, this small uh, island called uh, Supeter. Supeter, uh, the author of this book, uh, asked uh, himself how people could survive from uh, uh, survive starvation and cold uh, weather, and especially during uh, long, long winter, because this uh, small island is only a few meters above the sea uh, level. The story goes on, and then uh, here is uh, the another another one one more uh, task. Uh, uh, it uh, 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 it uh, it uh, demands uh, or actually it suggests uh, to students uh, the next uh, situation. In March, two people from the island of Lockwood who went to their home island despite to ban were punished. So obviously that the main uh, uh, reason to stop uh, infectious diseases was the politics of uh, social uh, distancing. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, story map have, uh, has an introduction to the body, but I deliberately uh, didn't put a conclusion because uh, this is something that students should uh, uh, the result the student should uh, uh, produce it themselves and uh, uh, in this situation uh, I can share my opinion and my opinion is that, that this measure uh, measures against uh, uh, 
uh, infectious diseases were steadily improving and uh, that uh, the government of Dubrovnik was uh, uh, really skillful in uh, making uh, a lot of uh, good uh, decisions uh, that uh, helped the situation to become better. Uh, of course, uh, because I'm not expert in medical science, uh, maybe this my conclusion uh, can be uh, is wrong. But for sure, uh, big uh, diseases, uh, the outbreaks of infectious diseases uh, affected uh, strongly social, economical, political structure. And it's very interesting topic that might uh, uh, attract a lot of attention from uh, students. Furthermore, I want to harness the power of uh, maps uh, provided by uh, Story uh, Map Cascade application. And I made uh, one interactive map below, uh, which shows the location of some less known uh, toponyms mentioned in the learning material. Not every student uh, should know. Okay, I can hear the music, thank you. Uh, 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 should know the location of small islands like Kolochep, Loput, or something. So for these purposes, there is this map which is uh, interactive and you can navigate uh, through it. Uh, so uh, and when we, when we talk about sticky components. Uh, the stickiness of the education process will be promoted too. The focus is on the short, but still the most exciting and essential segment, segment of the source material, which students have to select and type down during classroom activities or as a homework a task. And open education um, component is uh, represented through open uh, science framework. It is just one among many uh, uh, platforms, but from some, for some reason I like to use this one. Uh, the selected part uh, will be publicly available on the Open Science uh, Framework uh, platform. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Vladimir. Um, I, I'll uh, just allow, you know, if you can uh, maybe... Start my answer us uh, really quickly uh, that how did you uh, your students respond uh, uh, to this way of learning it's a, it's a great example this one you uh, but it's also a great tool uh, I don't know because uh, this is everything is in the developing uh, ah, it's sorry. in the making yes yeah. I'm sorry and uh, of course story map uh, is not uh, ready yet um, I have to publish it, uh, and uh, I it uh, requires uh, more uh, work, uh, and I'm not in situation to put a lot of work right now. And also, I would like to hear your comments because any kind of I'm new in um, I'm new in uh, flip classroom, and okay, I have some experience with open education. I really I, I conducted several projects with my students. Uh, 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 using open science framework, and it gave good results, I think. I think it's, uh, it was uh, uh, also a very uh, um, uh, compelling example you gave, uh, and I, I really hope we can uh, sort of save this and, and get back to it in our closing discussion. I think uh, it was a beautiful presentation, so I would like to thank you very much for that. Um, sure. I enjoyed to, to make, of making it. It's, it's really intriguing topic, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, and and uh, please, everybody, uh, um, think about this and we'll get back to, you know, uh, how, how would, uh, um, uh, how could we perhaps discuss uh, um, uh, the tool that Vladimir is uh, developing? Uh, and which looks really, really great. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like now to give uh, the space uh, um, to, to Esther, um, Kamara, 
who is going to talk to us about uh, oral histories, a critical look at the practice of preserving oral histories and how this may reflect on digital humanities learning, um, which is a great topic and I think we will have a great case. Please, Esther. Um, okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name is uh, Esther Aminata Kamara. Uh, I am a student at the Maastricht University and I'm doing the a Master's Media Studies Digital Cultures, which means that I've uh, kind of the guinea pig of the Ignite as well. And today I'll be speaking about digital oral histories and having a critical look at the practice of preserving oral histories. Um, so this is not necessarily a research in a formal sense, it's more of a narrative journey. And I'll explain to you why that is the case. Uh, in this presentation, I have three parts. I have a contextualization, I have three case studies, and then I have a reflection where I'll also bring it back to uh, digital humanities and Ignite. So the first contextualization is about oral traditions and histories. So before, um, I'm going to be speaking about Limba uh, oral histories, which is a tribe of Sierra Leone in West Africa. And I'm not going to say that that's the tradition that's being practiced worldwide. There's a lot of different traditions um, and these are all different practices. In Sierra Leone specifically, there's um, oral histories have recitals, which include songs and drumming and dancing and call and response, which are almost like the multimodal elements of a story. Different formats would be parables, myths, folklore, but also the ritual chanting of craftsmen, for example, when they're working with wood, they'll be chanting and it's a way to also communicate with the spirits. Uh, it's an intergenerational practice. So the knowledge dynamics goes from teacher to student or from parents to children, but also it has a functional and a communal uh, function from, for example, village leader to villagers. Um, I have a very interesting quote, I think, uh, about from Augustine Mara, which says that stories and their accompanying songs are the link between the past, the present and the future. Um, and when we then link this to the last point, which is that the teller and listener become living archives, it means that every time a, tori a story is told, the listener becomes the potential teller and stores the story in uh, his or her own memory bank. So it's not an external source, and it's not an external archive, these are kept inside. Now on the right, you'll see some connotative binaries, and um, this is that because the oral is often opposed to the written, the traditional to the modern, and the colonial to the indigenous. And I think this categorization is sometimes problematic. Um, but also when you then see the quote here by Miruwewa, I don't know how to pronounce that, excuse me. We see this concern with the written uh, because of the influence of the foreign hand. Um, and when you look at uh, oral histories in Sierra Leone before the arrival of the European, there was no written uh, uh, kind of archiving practice. Everything was done orally and in your own memory bank. So then is an oral history free from colonial influence? Is the written colonial? Do they capture different forms of narratives? Um, and I think I don't have answers to these questions, but what I do think is very important that in Sierra Leone, the oral is a really important aspect of information dissemination, but it's not an aspect of formal institutions. So education, uh, formal education will not be focusing on oral deliveries. It's a very Western kind of uh, way of looking at information. So we'll go to the second part. Um, with Oral histories, there's a concern because it's intergenerational, goes from teller to, to listener. We now have a generation gap. There's a mass uh, modernization, urbanization. So uh, youth is moving away from the rural areas and living in cities. And the problem of living archives is that when they pass away, they're gone. So because the archive is internal, there's no way to access these stories anymore. Also, predominantly, um, the archiving practices have been focused on material um, heritage, so a lot of texts, documentation, artifacts, which stems from the colonial era and is still being continued nowadays. There are some efforts to also archive uh, immaterial practices, but this is often through foreign funding. Then when we look at the digital, this might really be an opportunity to archive oral histories uh, because it's 
a lot of Sierra Leoneans have mobile phones, etc. Um, within the uh, digital humanities, there's also this debate on uh, preserving history in, um, let's say, post-colonial settings, it might be neo-colonial. Is it oppressive or is it a tool for uh, liberation? And my question is also, who are we archiving for? Because if we archive for Sierra Leoneans and we put it in an external database, um, we might not be really designing it for them as users because there's a lot of illiteracy, there's not always access to resources, and the idea of um, gathering knowledge in an outside institution is maybe sometimes also a bit foreign. Um, so then question, how can we then archive oral histories is such a way that there's ownership of the archiving practice as well as accessibility for those related to the archive. Well, and then I stumbled upon an issue because when I wanted to find uh, some practices of capturing oral histories, I got stuck in a feedback loop because textually there's very little. There's a British lady who wrote down some of the limp of, uh, of the traditional stories. And what I actually found was that I stayed within my own tribe. My father is a Limba from Sierra Leone. And this meant that I um, was only really able to access that which I had a relation to, which I think is a very important aspect of um, um, oral histories as well. So what am I speaking of? I'm speaking of um, Northern Sierra Leone, Cambia District, Tsonko Limba. It's uh, one of the 16 tribes. And I have three uh, narratives that I found that came to me or that I actively sought. Um, and that's why I'm also saying it's not really a research, it's more of a narrative journey because um, I, it was really circumstantial evidence that came to me. These were all user uploads. So they're all kind of informal sources. The first one is a um, voice note that my father forwarded to me. Um, and I'll play to you a short fragment. Thank you, Kohyu, the Wondoma, Namim Poina. Sorry, so the, it's in Limba, which I don't speak, by the way, and it's a man explaining uh, the history behind the names of the months in Limba. And it's an, an old, old tradition, it's a real like knowledge dissemination. Um, and interestingly, there was no visible author, there is no known audience, there's no timestamp, there's no metadata. When I told, asked my father what this is, he then forwarded the screenshot you see on the right um, and said, it's the months of the year. It, the author wasn't really that important, it, said, it seemed. So then uh, the second one is, uh, I think my favorite because I um, asked my cousin, Yaya, if he, if he has some stories for me for this research. And a day later, I received these two voice notes. Um, I hope you were able to hear that there's crickets in the background, you can hear some noises, there's actually, if you listen to the whole bit, it's a call and response. And this is a real oral tradition, it's a, a oral history of uh, Limba people, it also was uh, spread through WhatsApp, it was a direct transmission from him to me. Again, there's no visible author, there's a known audience, there's me and the people who were there in the room. Um, but for the rest, this you guys are hearing it. I don't think the author knows, knew that that was going to happen. So then we go to the last one real quickly, which is a bit more of the archiving practice that we know. That is, is taken from a story about a monster and a village bell. And Okay, so this is a man who actually wrote a little book about Limba stories, self-published, and he's showing the accompanied songs because he believes that they cannot be disseminated, they cannot be, uh, I mean, detached from one another. And this is a more of a search-oriented approach to finding these narratives. It's, it's an archive, it's on YouTube, and there's a visible author of stories, it's this man, but there's the, still the unknown author of the people who originally made this, these stories. So... What does this mean? Uh, real quick synthesization is that there's audience time space archive. Um, I will skip the audience bit, but the time and space thing uh, within these oral histories on the digital, they're unbound. The story travels and evolves. It exists as a potentiality. It really mimics the diaspora movement of the Limba people and the Sierra Leonean people. 
And because of the low data costs, uh, it's actually very accessible to Sierra Leone use. You can download it, you can listen to it offline. Um, and then as an archive, because it's fluid and unbound and unstructured, um, it can exist anywhere at any space, but you need a relational context in order to, in order to access it. I had to be of the Limba tribe to get these oral uh, histories. Uh, and it moves through a viral pathway uh, through WhatsApp. You cannot find it if you're not looking for it apart from the third one. So we've moved from being a personal memory bank here in the story, becoming a potential teller, to one having a virtual digital storage that is outside of you and in a mobile phone that's always quite near to you. Um, I'm going to skip this because of time issues. Um, but this last, this quote of Mr. Kagbo is about Sierra Leone being a culture where hearing takes precedence over seeing and where things are heard and identified at a distance, be it in broad daylight or in darkness. And this kind of focus on the oral and what the oral means and the spoken means versus the textual, the written, really shows that a lot of Sierra Leonean culture and how information survives, is disseminated and evolves is really through orality. And that means that maybe we should also recognize this more strictly as a source. So this brings me to the last bit, which is the digital humanities reflection. And um, first of all, um, when becoming a per this memory bank and the story and the teller and the potential um, and the listener potential teller, there's this real um, responsibility within oral history culture to become aware of your own knowledge and see yourself as a source of information. Um, and I think that for students, this is very interesting because if you are aware of your own frame of reference, the moment you interact with a story or you reproduce the story, this is a new layer of critical thinking. So that's my student perspective. Um, broader sense, I think that recognizing alternative contexts as starting points for academic inquiries can lead to really interesting findings and new sources of information, and it can enrich the curriculum as well. Lastly, I think there's also an issue with uh, oral texts and, and power at all, they uh, really have a good quote uh, about uh, oral histories in American, uh, Native American practices, is that in the case of oral history, there are neither authors nor publication dates. Um, so how in an academic setting can we then take these oral uh, sources? Um, how can we see that they're genuine? Are they authentic? And does that actually fit the way an oral narrative exists because there is no author? Uh, that's their exact form. They always evolve and transform. Uh, there's always a listener and a teller. And um, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Esther, for a fascinating presentation. Really <laughs> um, lovely. Um, um, I'm looking if anybody ha has sort of the one question that I can allow now doesn't seem as if um, so I, I think again we should think about this and and about how like in this case uh, oral histories but also very immaterial uh, culture is situated and uh, I wanted to ask you actually uh, compared to what you might have of actually stored uh, material uh, um, uh, of this kind, which would sometimes be stored in what you might call the colonial archive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where you see the opportunities in this much more fluid and uh, um, changing archival practice that, that you have sort of uh, started uh, unraveling. Yeah, sorry, what's the question exactly? Yeah, uh, you know, you, you would have things stored uh, uh, also like recorded and stored uh, uh, very much often in sort of the central archives, which could also be the colonial archives, right? Yes. Uh, and where you see the possibility of sort of um, a kind of learning process in the more fluid archival uh, practice you have seen like uh, um, 
Yeah, I definitely think that um, the, the static archives, uh, they're not really visited by Sierra Leoneans at all. Museums are always empty and there's only tourists kind of visiting them. And then there's this uh, huge uh, movement of like user generated content and archiving practices that's spontaneous. Um, and even though there's always concern about, okay, you're using WhatsApp, you're using YouTube, Google, et cetera, and data and privacy. Uh, there's also, people feel it's very intuitive for people to use this. And I think that if you see what people are archiving themselves and how this movement happens, then maybe the traditional static archives can also learn from that. Um, so I think there's, a, there's an interaction there that's potentially very interesting. I think it's fascinating. <laughs> I hope to get to talk you, to you about this at another uh, time. And I think we should take this also on to our uh, final discussion. It's a kind of a case of secondary orality in a way. Uh, um, uh, so now I would like to thank our three speakers uh, from this uh, first part of our uh, route table. Uh, and to uh, um, announce that we will have a short break now for 10 minutes and be back here uh, at five past uh, where we'll open the second session of the round table. Hello everybody. Um, I'm Anna Woltrich from the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna. I'm the host of this session. And I'd like to point you out to our Twitter discussion that we got going on under the hashtag Ignite Roundtable. And we're celebrating today as well the day of DH2020. So if you're using the hashtag um, day, uh, day of DH2020, you will also find tweets about our session. So let's start. Let me introduce you to your moderator, Kostas Papadopoulos, who is an IGNITE colleague and who is specialized in digital ecology and heritage, primarily in 3D recording, visualization, simulation and analysis of spaces and artifacts. Currently he's an assistant professor in digital humanities and culture studies at Ma Maastricht University. Hi Kostas. Hi Anna, you will need to activate my video. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. We did earlier. Yeah. Are you with us? Yes. Hi. Okay. So welcome back, uh, everybody, to the second part of the Ignite Roundtable. For those of you who just joined, uh, just to remind you that we would very much welcome your questions and comments uh, for each of the presentations by using the Q&A feature here on Zoom. Or if you feel more comfortable, you can even post a question in the chat. Uh, I'll be, I will uh, make sure to transfer your question to the to the speakers. Um, and also, as Anna told you, there is a concurrent conversation on Twitter um, on the direct feeds channel that you can join. But please do not forget to use the hashtag Ignite Roundtable for any questions or comments. So for the second and last part of the Ignite Roundtable, we have three speakers. We have uh, Stefania Saba from the Cyprus University of Technology. We have Chiara Zwani and Franz Dorfler from uh, University of Graz and Nimra Said from Ontario College of Art and Design University in Canada. And without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, the first speaker, Stefania Saba from the Cyprus University of Technology. Uh, who is going to talk about design thinking in interactive digital narratives for culturally and linguistically diverse students, museum school synergies and museum affinity spaces. Uh, Stefania, the screen is yours. Thank you, Kostas. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. So uh, let me just try to share my screen with you. Okay. Um, I hope you can see the presentation. Everything good? Yes, we can see. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So um, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to be part of this uh, digital series. Um, I think it's a challenge to be presenting online, but it's one that I'm very happy to take up and try to see what we can make of it. 
Um, I have adjusted the presentation a bit uh, since uh, we have uh, much less time, I think, to, <laughs> to present. And I apologize beforehand if, uh, if, if it's too much information. You, you can feel free to stop me, of course. <laughs> so um, now I'm, I'm a postdoc researcher working at uh, a research lab at uh, Cyprus University of Technology. Um, and our work mainly uh, are, uh, involves design for social change. So part of this work uh, has been addressed in this project that's uh, been funded. Um, and it's a project I have been awarded, uh, 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 I mean, a uh, half one, and a, one year and a half ago. So um, I'm actually completing this post at uh, the moment. However, my presentation will focus on part of uh, the second phase of the project. So uh, to get on with it. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, just a second, because the Zoom <laughs> is kind of preventing me. <laughs> to see part of the presentation, apologies. So, okay, so before I get into the, the, the actual project, I'd like to touch upon two main concepts uh, for, for our work. The first is interactive digital narratives, and the second one is design, design thinking, and especially design for social change. So um, interactive digital narratives um, is, uh, is not an emerging term. It has been around for uh, at least 20 years, I, I, I assume. So uh, what's been happening now with the proliferation of technology is that uh, we're trying to see how we can bridge the gap between the user and the creator and uh, have a more dynamic uh, relationship between the two. And, and the way to do this is through participatory enga engagement. So um, let's see. Uh, okay. IDN, uh, the acronym for uh, Interactive Digital Narratives. So IDN is used mainly in the world of entertainment uh, for gaming. However, we, we see it now evolving into uh, being part of uh, the development of more serious applications uh, called serious games, at of, often at times, uh, and edutainment. Edut edut sorry, so um, it's it's a multidisciplinary field, and also I I consider that it's. Uh, an interdisciplinary challenge. Uh, this has been addressed um, in different uh, uh, projects uh, over the past de decade, where uh, we can see there is this vision of IDN being um, as much as as much about narrative as it and control as it is about having a balance. So uh, the designer, the creator. Uh, tries to let's say it's it's sort of a balancing act between uh, the the creator of, of a game over of an environment where the user interacts and uh, also one where we have this uh, agent the user agency and and this uh, freedom to navigate to to direct let's say the learning experience um, so this is not only an artistic challenge, but it's also one that, that's technological and also analytical in its essence. Um, now, uh, the, the second concept, uh, and, and it's also a field and a discipline on its own that's quite interdisciplinary, uh, is uh, designed for social change. At the research lab where I work uh, and collaborate with uh, Dr. Uh, Suleles, who I, whom I quote here, uh, discussing uh, design for social change, we see it as an umbrella term uh, covering a broad range of activities, uh, all having a shared focus on social issues. So uh, there are different, different motivations, perspectives, and approaches uh, when we discuss design for social change. Uh, but uh, prevalent, prevalent among these uh, uh, approaches and strategies is um, 
uh, the process of design thinking. Uh, we often also see uh, the the field of ethnography being addressed and employed and also action research so uh, in our work we try to merge all these fields and approaches and motivations into uh, mainly e-learning uh, technology enhanced learning uh, for uh, underprivileged groups so that's quite important because I mentioned in my uh, in, in the title of this presentation uh, how we try to address the needs of culturally and linguistically diverse students. So moving on, um, just an overview of, of what I'll try to discuss in the next couple of minutes is uh, let's say first of all uh, the project that I'm currently completing uh, has uh, the, the brief let's say the acronym is MAS now the project is about museum affinity spaces and how I I, I take uh, the challenge of reimagining museum school partnerships in the in the context of uh, 21st century uh, this is the follow-up of my doctoral research so it's kind of the vision I had when I took up my PhD and now I carry on uh, at the postdoc level and hopefully continue to work on it and, and, and improve and uh, learn through the, the, the journey as, as I go on. Uh, um, now, I'm, I look at it through, the, through a multi-literacy lens. I'll explain in, in, a, in short what I mean. Now, the project lasts for two years and um, the purpose of the research is mainly to explore uh, the nature of museum-based multiliteracies first and second to establish what is perhaps an appropriate and relevant uh, theory-based interdisciplinary framework uh, for how we can develop sustainable and inclusive museum school partnerships. Um, Okay, oh, sorry, I have to move faster. So, uh, why online museum school synergies? Uh, the question is, <laughs> I think it's been answered by the, 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 the environment and, and the particular period that we are experiencing at the moment. Uh, the world is becoming increasingly digitally medi mediated and we see this urgent need, especially for educators um, and, and everyone surrounding this uh, field and, and let's say domain to develop strategies for a computer support, supporter uh, design based learning through processes that address sustainability and design thinking is I believe at the top of this, uh, let's say, um, need and um, um, let's say discourse. So some 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 of the um, areas that we hope to be working on through this project are addressed here. I will not elaborate on that. Um, so uh, the target group for our research are is um, sorry are uh, museum educators, uh, school teachers and students uh, coming from different backgrounds in particular in particular we focus on them we're talking about primary and secondary education and uh, we're taking a museum based approach to integration of uh, different uh, initiatives and programs for students um, so uh, what are museum affinity spaces? So this is a concept I touch upon uh, based on this um, conce conceptualization of what is an affinity space, which is uh, basically a, a virtual or physical space where informal learning takes place. Uh, I introduce uh, the role of museum and, and virtual mu uh, learning environments uh, in this context of affinity spaces. Uh, as during my PhD, I, I looked into the potential for student-generated affi museum affinity spaces. Now, um, 
In this project, however, uh, we take it a step further and look at virtual museum and environments as learning agents uh, through uh, application of the notion of interactive digital narratives. Uh, so multiliteracy en engagement uh, has a primary role in our work and especially this is uh, uh, what I am mostly uh, worried about, how we can, uh, let's say, and, and also feel challenged to, to discover more, how multiliteracy is a matter of design because learning is considered a process of dynamic, iterative meaning making. And uh, our students are the ones who have to shape, reshape uh, the learning process. And um, we feel that through it, uh, application of design thinking strategies and interactive digital narratives, we have a better opportunity and, and potential to activate the, the multimodal meaning, meaning making modes uh, that we can uh, find in a virtual learning environment. So we talk about designs of meaning and in multiliteracy theory we have available designs and we have designing and the redesign. These are three phases, put it simply, for students to take up um, uh, learning as designers themselves. So Okay. Um, one more theory that we try to touch upon, and we have a framework uh, based on, on, on this um, overlap and in interactivity aspect between the, the theories we incorporate is flow theory, being in a state of flow. Uh, when immersed in, in an environment such as a virtual learning environment, we, 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 of, we often see ourselves uh, being uh, so much immersed in this uh, unconscious and conscious condition uh, and the challenges that, that occur, but also the learning that occurs during this process is of importance to our work. Um, I'll leave this part out because it doesn't, it's, it doesn't add to uh, the presentation. So uh, you can see here our design thinking process in, in, in um, let's say, uh, as an overview how we went about to think of our uh, research. Um, uh, so we went to, we decided to use design-based research as a, as a strategy for our uh, research here. And I won't get into much more detail about what we did. However, there were different challenges through the prototyping stage. This is the second stage of, of uh, of, of design-based research. So going from preliminary context analysis with um, um, interviews uh, with students and teachers to see what their needs are in order to inform our uh, interactive digital narrative and the virtual environment we developed, we went to the prototyping phase. And very briefly talking about it, um, there were different challenges in terms of embracing the possibilities of interactivity in, in our work. Uh, we are a small group of three people and some of these challenges have been addressed, others will be refined during the second iterative uh, phase, um, sorry, stage of our work. Uh, there were also design-based uh, challenges uh, for our web developer and the multimedia designer. Um, okay, as, as always, I'm not good with time, so I won't go into detail. I, I can share my presentation with you, however. And there were also technical challenges uh, in terms of actually, okay, I'll go back on that one, in terms of developing the virtual learning environment and how we can incorporate the interactive uh, digital narrative we had in mind based on feedback from students. I'll just very, very quickly close with this um, okay, presentation. The overview of uh, the feedback and the first couple of findings from uh, actual implementation with primary and secondary students. So these are some 
of the views they express, their perceptions and um, their, uh, let's say, feedback and suggestions for improvement of the virtual uh, environment we developed, which was a desktop application, by the way, due to some of the challenges we had at uh, the first stage. So I, I'm not sure if I managed with my time. Uh, however, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity and thank you for your attention. <laughs> uh, many thanks, uh, uh, Stephanie, for your presentation and for your very uh, nicely designed PowerPoint. Um, I, th I think it worked well with the whole idea of, of narratives. Um, I think, you know, you, what you presented very well is that and, you know, I'm trying to think museums have been trying for like decades in a way to um, reinvent themselves with these open and more participatory approaches to curation and to engagement. Um, and you bring another thing in the discussion, which is this collaboration now of museums with schools in an online environment. And we we don't have uh, much uh, time for uh, for questions now, but uh, there are two things. One is how does this online collaboration? How does this change the whole idea of narratives in museums, which very often are you know very linear, for example, or very narrowly conceived in a museum space, in a physical space, and sometimes even when these narratives are mediated by technology. Uh, they're probably driven more by some technological fetishism rather than, um, you know, by the idea of the of the narrative itself. So just to um, have that as a as a question on the side, and there is also a question from uh, Susan, which is, uh, if you have any ideas, what museums can do in the short term, short term with their online content for all the kids stuck at home, because museums have a lot online, but it's not good for education without a lot of mediation, which most teachers and parents do not have the time for. So, you know, just a very, very quick reflection, and then I'm sure we'll have time to uh, get back to that um, uh, during the discussion. Yes, uh, well, thank you, Kosos. I think those are very important questions uh, raised, and I think it, it kind of informs my own personal journey as, as a researcher because I come from an education background. So uh, I think this is kind of, um, um, let's say, a challenge that I can, I can see uh, educators, museum educators, and school teachers having now with the pandemic. Uh, what I can say is that because I presented only uh, just a tiny bit of the of the project, what we have in mind and what I've been, what I am working on is a holistic framework um, um, incorporating a digital infrastructure. So uh, let's say our platform has not only the virtual uh, environment itself, the application and the interactive digital narrative, but also it, it allows for the partnerships to grow. It supports it supports teachers with resources and uh, pedagogical uh, scenarios to, to apply and, and, and relate and uh, collaborate uh, in the long term with museums. So it gives another uh, edge, let's say, uh, to the whole concept of museum school partnerships. So because in this presentation, uh, the focus on, was uh, specifically on, virtual, on the virtual learning environment, and because I thought it was more relevant. However, in terms of your question, I think that what we what we have to offer and introduce, let's say, to the world, is this um, holistic uh, framework to take up the challenge of uh, not being that uh, mainstream um, physical present museum for the twenty first century. On the contrary. So we, we also build a lot on uh, the notion of learning on, on the notion of uh, learning ecosystems, which mm -hmm. I haven't touched upon. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And, and uh, I would say, you know, we can leave your response to Susan's question about, you know, what do we do with this content online? How, you know, how can we make it work? 
uh, for you know different demographics because also this is very relevant to the following presentation so i'm sure this will be very good for our final discussion so thank you very much again uh, stefania and let's now move to our second presentation uh cara zwani and franz uh, dorfler from the university of Granz, uh, who are going to talk about uh, digiculture a mooc for creative industries uh, professionals. Uh, Cara and Franz, uh, welcome. And the screen is yours. Thank you. And thank you very much uh, for organizing uh, this uh, great uh, uh, series of roundtables. I hope now you can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, today I and Franz uh, will present the project uh, DigiCulture and uh, we are talking also on behalf of our colleague Walter Scholger. I will begin by giving you a generic introduction to the projects uh, and the context in which we are working and then Franz uh, will show you an example uh, of uh, one of, our, of the units we are preparing. The project uh, DigiCulture is uh, uh, an Erasmus Plus project uh, which started last year in October 2018 and will finish in spring. Uh, the project uh, is led by the Polytechnic University of Timisara and the other partners include uh, the University of Roma 3, Holborg University, Dublin City University, uh, JME Associates uh, which is based in Birmingham and uh, the Lithuanian National Association of Distance uh, Education. So most of the partners comes from the area of uh, learning and distance learning and we are one of the few uh, digital humanities partners. Our aim is uh, to develop uh, digital competencies of adults in the creative and industrial industries and to provide opportunities for developing the digital skills necessary for working in the sector. So in practice uh, we are developing a massive online open course for adult learners with low digital skills in order to foster their employability. And uh, we are in particular uh, targeting learners from the partner countries uh, by developing the content both in English uh, and in the various uh, national languages uh, of the partners. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are also liaising uh, with uh, the European Capital of Cultures organization, in particular uh, with uh, Timisoara, which uh, we lost, uh, we lost uh, the European Capital of Culture in 2021 and uh, the Irish partner have been working also with Galway, which was the capital of culture this year, although now the program has been interrupted by coronavirus. And the Lithuanian partner are working uh, with uh, Kaunas, which we lost uh, uh, the award of the uh, European capital of culture in 22. The project main outcome uh, will be uh, this uh, uh, massive online open course called uh, Digital Skills and Social Inclusion for Creative Industries and it will be piloted in a blended learning format later this year and will then be available on a Moodle-based uh, virtual learning hub which uh, will be open to everyone. We started working uh, in October 2018 and during the first few months of the project uh, we produced a literature review, a literature review exploring the application of the European DIG Comp, so the Digital Competence Framework by the European Union, in the creative industry sector, uh, which meant uh, mapping each skills identified in uh, the EU document against existing literature and data from digital humanities uh, and creative industries. This uh, was complemented last spring by a series of surveys and short interviews with professionals uh, in which we are made to assess uh, the everyday use of technology and uh, the skills uh, and practices that they considered crucial for uh, the training needs of the sector. Uh, the results of this uh, work led to the preparation of a syllabus uh, and currently we are working on uh, uh, developing the content uh, and implementing it on the Moodle platform. Each uh, of the partners uh, is working on uh, one or two modules uh, and uh, we are all offering also uh, case studies uh, to each of the modules uh, in the project. Uh, this uh, is the list of the 13 modules uh, we selected. And uh, we, here at Unigrat, we are working on data protection and open licenses and on digital curation, but we are providing case studies also for all the other different uh, uh, 
modules so for digital storytelling, so some media for culture, augmented and virtual re reality, uh, mobile apps and mobile, mobile user experience, and so on. Uh, the course uh, Data Protection and Open Licenses uh, is led uh, by Walter Scholger, and uh, I'm instead leading on the course in digital curation, uh, uh, digital libraries and museums. And uh, now I leave uh, uh, the stage to Franz, uh, which will present you an example uh, of uh, the work he has been doing uh, on this uh, module. So Franz, all yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, what I want to present to you now, uh, as Chiara said, is a little preview of one of our courses uh, inside the DigiCulture project. I myself have contributed in the selection and preparation of the course's content, which I'm right now uploading to the virtual learning platform in Moodle. My part of the presentation today will focus on two aspects. First, I want to show you some of the content of the course, of course. And secondly, I want to talk about our process of thought while developing it. That being said, uh, I want to present to you now the module Digital Curation, Digital Libraries and Museums. This module aims to introduce the learners to the digital practices in the archive and museum sector. It covers the topics of digitization, data modeling, collection management systems, online collections and virtual exhibitions, engagement with online collections, folksonomies and crowdsourcing. The first OER of this module was all about digitization. As you can imagine, this is quite a broad topic to convey in a simple and short manner for our target audience, adult learners in the creative industry with low digital skills. I should first add that we follow the same structure across our models in which we aim to offer definition and some context to the themes. Some examples of existing projects, tools and solutions and of course some exercises. So my first task in developing this OER was to give a clear and on-point definition and information about the topic itself. To be clear, we are talking about digitalization both of texts and of objects, and we aim our learners to get an overview of some of the digitalization methods and of the implications of work working with different digitized materials in their own creative practice. In the case of digitization, we first presented the learner with a definition of the topic, highlighting the differences between digital, digitization and digitalization, which is particularly relevant for our uh, German language learners. And we pointed out some connections to everyday life methods of digitization they might already use and be accustomed to. We also emphasized that there's a variety of digitalization metho methods although we did not go into detail in describing them all. We choose instead two very different examples to demonstrate the different contexts, uses, and results of digitization. These examples aim to make the connections between the information they got in the first part and the practical use of it. So they showcase the range of possibilities. And so we choose a research project working with text, which you see here, transcribers, and a commercial solution for simply 3D modeling, clone. It had to be an example that on the one hand sparks interest, of course, and in the topic, uh, in the topic itself, and on the, other, and on the other hand, be not too complicated to understand for our level of learners. Transcribus itself is a software that uses OCR and layout analysis to transcribe printed as well as handwritten texts. And our goal here was to show that this tool is not only something a well-trained scientist can use, uh, but is also fairly accessible for researchers and interested people who want to try out and transcribe a text. Uh, also, our intention was to show uh, the potential of crowdsourcing for digitizing cultural heritage. The second example instead uh, it goes in a completely different direction. We want to show that not only text and pictures can be digitized, but also everyday life objects. And that good results for generic purposes can be obtained with something everybody of us have in their pocket, smartphone. Therefore, we show the example of a commercial app that facilitates the creation of 3D models thanks to the principles of photogrammetry, clone. This brings us to our third part of the digitization unit providing them with a task to do, 
to not only let them see the practical use of digitization, but also let them learn by doing. We are doing this drawing on the latest example, the app clone, which is in its basic form and functionalities free to use for everybody. We offer a step-by-step -step guidance from downloading the app, installing it, starting it and using it. And thanks to also to further links and existing introductions and tutorials uh, on the support page of Clone, we guide the learners in creating their own 3D model and in the end then exporting it as a GIF to our Moodle page to share it with other participants of the course. Yes, this is just one example of uh, one of our OERs uh, and the first one in the model of digital curation in libraries and museums. Thank you. Uh, as mentioned, we follow a similar structure for every OER we are creating, giving uh, information and uh, definitions on the topic, giving examples of the topic, and then in the end, trying out your new gained knowledge on a task to do. Uh, these are the foundation of every course we are currently developing and transferring to the platform mobile to hopefully create an, a useful, massive open online course for striving and interested adult learners in the creative industry. Yes, that was it for our presentations. Thank you for having us and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Kara and uh, Franz for your presentation and, and good luck uh, with your uh, project. I think probably the part that uh, was left out of the presentation is the implementation in the platform, which actually probably is uh, one of the most difficult things. And, you know, we in Dariot Teach have really invested a lot and probably suffered a lot also in the process of thinking and rethinking how we can um, move these into an online environment where probably there is no teacher, there's no synchronicity and so forth. I have several questions, but I will go to Marianne's question, which is, you know, you said that uh, your uh, your target audience is, uh, your target audience is the culture and creative industries, but the field is very broad and very diverse and probably the skills uh, required are equally diverse. So your question is which parts of the creative industry sector uh, does the project address? What user groups, for example? We had a lot of discussion on this on the project. Uh, and the, our main target uh, are actually uh, the volunteers uh, for European Capital of Cultures. Uh, so uh, the one in Timisoara next year in Primis uh, and the organization of, this, of that event uh, was uh, a partner in the project. Uh, and is now associate partners, uh, and uh, we are uh, talking with Kaunas to train also the volunteers in 22. So it will be uh, volunteers, uh, uh, young people uh, or unemployed people which are being uh, enrolled uh, in the staff of the European Capital of Culture team uh, uh, in uh, these months. Uh, and this is our primary target. Uh, then we had a lot of discussion on which sector within the creative industries to work with. Uh, uh, when we worked uh, with a digital competencies framework, uh, we were looking at uh, a pretty wide range and we interviewed people that went from performance, uh, uh, theater, um, dance, uh, but also with uh, artists uh, who want uh, to market their own art. Uh, and uh, uh, we are kind of uh, keeping this wide open at the moment yet. Uh, it will be most a problem for the recruitment uh, of the test uh, uh, for the for running the blended learning uh, when we will have to really narrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sure we'll have uh, more time to um, to discuss this further during the uh, the last discussion session. So let's now move to the final presentation for today by Nimra Said uh, from the Ontario College of Art and Design University in Canada. Uh, who is going to talk about embracing design thinking for sustainable fashion. All right. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen first. Um, and I'm assuming you guys can see and hear me well, unless I'm told otherwise. Yes. So, all right, cool. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nimra Sayed, currently teaching in the Faculty of Design 
uh, at Ontario College of Art and Design, as uh, Costas mentioned. Um, this is based in Toronto. Uh, in the next few minutes, I will be sharing with you my experience of using design thinking for making fashion circular through the introduction of a course called Sustainable Fashion. Um, this course was basically conceived and designed at Interactive Media Arts Program, which is housed in uh, New York University in Shanghai. And I did this during my research fellowship over there. So, okay, just let me see if I can. Um, sorry, I need to reshare this. Technical glitches. All right, I can move forward now. Um, so before we move forward, let me give you a little context about the program itself. Um, you know, as the name suggests, Interactive Media Arts, or I mean short, um, is an undergraduate program in emerging media where the students are encouraged to combine practice and theory um, through the acquisition of technical skills and conceptual insights. So the areas of expertise range uh, quite broadly from media theory to creative coding, um, from philosophy of technology to um, construction of virtual and physical spaces, to interactive installations and so on and so forth. Um, there is a really strong sense of maker culture uh, already prevalent in the program, or you know, as we like to say, tinkering is part of the DNA of this program. Um, and I'll get back to it why I have been introducing it. Um, but moving on, uh, we have been talking about design thinking for a while now. You know, for this whole month since we've been having these uh, digital roundtables. And we all know design thinking as um, a five or sometimes six steps process, right? But we also know that these steps are not linear. Um, they're iterative and cyclical. The question lies basically in the methodology, uh, in the application of the methodology. So what I mean by that is think from designing products to organizations with this methodology. What really changes is basically the scale and so does the scope. Um, now imagine using the same methodology to economies, right? Uh, and not linear economy, but I'm talking about circular econ economy here, which uh, interestingly Peter has discussed today in detail. So uh, now if you start with that vision, how does that um, translate uh, or backtrack to designing companies, um, systems, and then ultimately products? So to help with this, um, IDEO and Ellen MacArthur Foundation basically collaborated to create a circular design guide um, that basically calls for a shift in the mindset uh, for circularity. Um, and what that means is that we need to basically reframe our thinking and move away from design and step into the process of like redesign. Um, this framework was basically the premise of sustainable fashion course at IMA, uh, where it, uh, the students actually, okay, I'm going to talk about three things here, where uh, students actually design interventions to incorporate sustainability as part of their design process in the various areas of the fashion industry, which, you know, um, you all might already know is one of the largest polluters in the world. Um, apart from this main project, the students were also encouraged to choose a topic of their own interest. Um, and share with their peers each week. So this student-led initiative gave them the opportunity to be part of the curriculum, which was unique to each group and uh, really aided the conversations amongst them. And then there were also workshops, which were organized for um, two main things, primarily. Um, one was the research techniques. So they could basically implement these techniques whenever it was needed during the different phases uh, of design thinking cycle. Um, for instance, um, in the exploration phase, uh, they could be using uh, live or video ethnography for observation to empathize, or in the ideation phase, you, they could be using body storming or role playing techniques such as six thinking hats. And there are lots of them, um, but just to give you guys an idea. Uh, and then secondly, it was, um, they were geared towards technical skill development. So these workshops were basically uh, there to help them with their prototyping and design development. Um, most of the students who self-organized uh, themselves in the groups uh, did have primary understanding of the skill that they were working with, but they also needed some additional support to develop their idea. 
So for instance, in, in this case, um, it related to probably digital fabrication or um, um, sewing or web development. So things like that. Um, also, I think there was um, a lot of uh, interest in developing uh, digital outcomes uh, for some reason. Um, so basically the class was organized in a way where the students uh, used a particular sustainability theory with the design thinking process to design their interventions. Um, the areas of interest were from production or consumption side, um, including sourcing of equal materials to watch less time to a shift in shopping experience through transparency and information. Um, however, I, um, overall, if we look at it, I think uh, there was an interest more from the consumption side. Um, yeah, and uh, what I will be doing right now is I'm going to take you through a couple of examples of the projects that the students produced, uh, just to give you guys an idea. So um, uh, this one uh, is called Suscannable. So this was basically a response to the problem where people have the intention for conscious consumption, but are not sure how to make the decisions to be more sustainable. Uh, as a result, this group uh, conceived a multi-layered solution targeted at changing the in-person shopping experience by utilizing QR codes, um, web pages, and a sustainability score. Uh, the reason that they were inspired by the QR codes was uh, there is a prevalent usage of mobile phones uh, and using uh, QR codes in China, and they wanted the concept of sustainability to be as easy as using um, WeChat or Alipay apps. So the, the experience was that the customer could walk into the store, see a piece of clothing and scan a QR code on its tag. Um, scanning the code would basically open up a web page, uh, which will have an image of the product uh, and an overall sustainability score and information about the brand and textile. So they created this uh, formula for the score, which was based on the brand score and textile score. The brand score was uh, based on how the brands treated the planet, the people, and the animals. And the textile score included the resource intensity, durability, and reusability. Um, I know this sounds too broad, and this is uh, something that they also realized through their process, uh, that if they needed the score to actually work, it needed to be based on a more thorough formula. Uh, and it needed a lot of collaboration for data to be shared within the whole chain of production. Um, also, it needed uh, to have collaboration with brands um, and uh, to be more transparent, right? And for them to be willing to integrate sustainability scores into their already existing ecosystem. And the next one here is uh, Swapper. Uh, this was basically a location-based mobile application, which was offered as a solution for digital natives to stay cool, make new friends, and most importantly, reduce environmental impact. Uh, this group basically wanted to make the experience of using secondhand clothing fashionable and as easy as basically swiping on Tinder. So it was during their user testing that they found an unintended consequence of this app where people were interested to um, use it to make new friends while swapping clothes, which was something that they had not thought of when they actually started off. Um, they later actually took this prototype to start AD, which is an incubation program, and they were the runner up over there. And then they continued to receive support to develop this um, further. Um, this one, um, Shanghai Co-op, is basically um, a digital fashion zine, uh, which is aimed at outlining sustainable shopping options without shaming consumers. Uh, the group actually provided six shopping options to stay fashionable and make gradual changes to their lifestyle. Um, and as the group puts it, without explicitly flashing sustainability in the reader's face. Um, so this was primarily in response to their research where they looked at what type of communication their uh, peers were receptive to. So they presented this lookbook in a way to grasp the attention by the visual appeal of the outfits uh, and included the subtle message in between. A um, few of the insights that I would like to share about this class um, include um, first and foremost interdisciplinarity. Um, and I know we have discussed this earlier with a more uh, sort of a rebellious approach as uh, anti-disciplinarity with Evelyn last week. Uh, but the reason I bring it up is that this course was basically open to students from multiple disciplines. 
and the result was a range of students apart from uh, IMA. Um, they basically came from uh, media, culture, and communication, um, political science, computer science, and humanities. Um, so what it did was that it created an interesting discourse and brought unique perspectives to their projects and to the topic discussions as well. And uh, another important aspect was that, you know, everybody had different skill sets. So those uh, skill sets brought together um, helped them in actualizing their ideas too. Um, the second one that I'm going to talk about is that uh, you know, the core idea of design thinking is to basically think by doing. So when when you think by doing, you're making the passive into active uh, and the visual or tangible outcomes add fuel to your thinking process. Um, so students basically who were, uh, especially from not so maker uh, disciplines or uh, I mean rather theoretical disciplines, found this approach to be highly uh, motivating and engaging. Um, and then, of course, because, you know, um, there was such a good uh, mix of students uh, and also because the programs at NYU Shanghai have a, a sort of a good balance of um, a mix of student body, which comprises of uh, young men and women locally from China and also abroad. So there was uh, a lot of cultures and knowledge uh, brought together in one class. And uh, because of this class makeup and the group collaborations were so diverse in nature, um, there was a lot of um, a contextual and place-based peer-to-peer uh, learning. Um, and then one thing that I wanna talk about is critique. Uh, we used critique, which is basically an unseen and unsaid step that needs to be explicitly part of the design thinking process. Um, and we shared feedback throughout in our class. Um, people who are familiar with design process in any capacity are well aware of the fact that the world is messy, right? Uh, it's beautiful, it's messy, um, but, and so is the design process, you know, if you're doing anything in this world. Uh, critique is therefore a significant part of the process in any design discipline and without it, design thinking could not be an iterative approach. Um, and that's what we did during different phases in our class. And okay, uh, so reflection. Um, this is, I'm just going to quickly uh, talk about it uh, just to add my opinion and reflect back on the process. Um, I find uh, the beauty of design thinking is that it's basically um, a mindset with which you approach a problem, and it should not be seen as a framework for all innovative solutions uh, within the confines of these steps. Uh, which is why it is essential to uh, personalize the process based on your needs and situations. Um, these steps have been proposed to make the process, you know, more democratic by giving um, more agency to and value addition by the stakeholders. However, uh, you know, there has been criticism and discomfort around the idea to what extent should the participation be to keep the process effective. Um, the key is that the participation should be adding value and not weigh down the process and pace of innovation. So uh, imagine from a participatory design mindset, if you think of the participation uh, of the stakeholders on the spectrum from uh, expert to user, uh, this is a design choice that the team needs to make uh, to define where on the spectrum that lies. Also design thinking has uh, notoriously become synonymous with sticky uh, notes for some reason. However, the idea was not to limit creativity with one set of tools or medium, but to basically uh, encourage the proliferation of ideas uh, within available resources and not focus on the aesthetics and make the iterative process faster. So here again, personalization is key to adapt to the process, uh, uh, adapt the process to your own needs and use tools to your advantage. Um, and that brings to another concern, which is uh, of the fidelity of the prototype that is created in response to the problem. Uh, once uh, a prototype is approved by all the stakeholders involved, it most likely goes back to the experts to work on what um, uh, we talk about the appearance or the aesthetic. Um, so before I wrap it up, I'd like to say the reason I talked about the program as a backdrop is critical. Um, to understand that situating this course in an environment where um, maker culture and tinkering is already so prevalent uh, gives some advantage, which might not exist otherwise, right? Uh, especially thinking about the current COVID scenario, 
Um, a few of the questions that I raise um, are how could we migrate these practices of makeoculture digital? Um, what does it mean for sustainable fashion? And is it even rising to the occasion given the discourse on excess and consumption? Um, how could sustainable practices be exercised online? And also, if we could take something away from this conversation, since we are here with respect to the Daria project, how could we integrate the concept of circularity in learning uh, in the humanities discipline and or um, any other discipline for that matter? Um, and this is it for today. I would like to thank you all for staying till the end and hearing me out and uh, the organizers of Ignite Roundtable, especially um, Anna, Tanya and the moderators, Marianne and Costas. Um, I would really love to hear if you guys have any comments, questions, um, suggestions, feedback. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mimra. Um, I think you gave us very interesting examples in, you know, thinking about sustainability and eco-friendly uh, fashion design. And I think your discussion of this mixture of critical making, uh, you know, thinking through making and design thinking to democratize design, I think uh, that was an extremely uh, interesting addition to, to the whole uh, discussion today. Uh, there is a question by Marianne and I can, uh, you know, Marianne, you can ask the question yourself, yourself. But in the meantime, I will also ask all the panelists and other <laughs> Ignite uh, team members, uh, Tanya, Anna, Susan, uh, Ciro, uh, Miki, to reveal themselves uh, so we can, uh, you know, have a further discussion. To Marianne. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you so much for a, a very, very interesting presentation. <clears throat> My question was uh, actually towards um, the students' uh, motivation, mm -hmm. uh, whether they would uh, uh, map their interventions uh, towards uh, um, circular economy, uh, the various stages in that, uh, and also uh, sort of towards the sustainability impact uh, on, say, the fashion industry, which is... Um, urgent, really urgent now. I think it's a Kodak moment for that industry. Um, and whether that is whether the meaning and change making factor of doing something like this uh, um, is a strong or was a strong motivation for the students. Yeah, um, so, you know, interestingly, um, when the students actually joined the class, just because the, the title itself was sustainable fashion, there was already an appeal uh, in the name, which was fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and, but after they joined the class, um, it was kind of an eye opener for a lot of them. That's the kind of feedback that I um, actually mm -hmm. got from them because um, we need to understand that they're all undergrad uh, students, right? Um, they, are at a stage in life where they're still exploring, you know, where their identities and they're super interested in how they're um, presenting themselves. And a lot of people had interest in fashion and they never really realized what's sort of going on behind the scenes. So although we started talking about uh, from the, either you're gonna take up uh, the, the thing that you're actually going to intervene from either production side or consumption side, mm -hmm. um, since a lot of students were not exposed how to the uh, to how the production side works, there was a, I think, a natural inclination from uh, creating something that could be from the consumer side more. Um, there was like some people took it really personally just to uh, see how their own individual yeah. things would impact. So um, there was also um, um, a group who actually worked with auto ethnographic as a research approach. Uh, to, you know, just see at an individual level, how am I making an impact and, you know, how much am I responsible for all of this? Of course, that doesn't create the whole picture because we don't know through how many hands this whole product comes to uh, us, but they were just using it from, you know, from, uh, from the cycle, as Peter mentioned, from their, like, the user um, cycle. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there questions from uh, the other panelists? 
uh, towards other panelists or some more uh, general thoughts, comments, any questions from uh, Twitter, Ciro? No? So I'm, I'm wondering probably a more general question towards all of you. You know, you all talked in your presentations about experimentation, uh, innovation, engagement, a typical scholarship, interdisciplinary work. So I'm just wondering, you know, just to go back to the theme of this roundtable, sticky learning, um, how do we need to transform our teaching and learning practices? What are the elements of our existing practice that we need to reconsider so as to provide competencies and skills for the digital and creative economy? You know, j just your thoughts on that. What, what is the way forward? Yes, Stefania. Um, I think because uh, this is another area where we are working out uh, in our lab, um, we're looking and we're actually part of uh, an Erasmus Plus project now, looking into um, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, cultural and arts entrepreneurship for uh, underprivileged female um, aspiring entrepreneurs. So this is a, a project I developed and um, so it's part of a personal, let's say, aspiration that I have. So um, what I would say is that uh, it's obvious based on, on several recent research, but um, we are lacking in terms of uh, providing our students with those transversal skills and soft skills that they need and competencies, because I prefer the term. Uh, so um, let's say that they, are, they, they need to have certain competencies to survive uh, and to excel even more so. Uh, so um, I have in mind the concept of um, nomad society uh, as in a KN, like knowing. So nomad society is, um, um, there is also a manifesto by John Moravec and I've recently uh, uh, contributed to, uh, a chapter to uh, their latest volume on discussing edu education futures. So uh, what they are saying is, and what he's, he suggests with uh, Cristobal uh, Cobo is that what we need to look into is, is how to bridge the gap and we have uh, a bit, Basically, we have a gap between what we offer now as educators and uh, in any field, like in and in any level of education, and uh, the job market and the needs that uh, the job market has. And uh, what they suggest is having um, uh, nomad work workers, so being creatives, um, digital uh, indi individuals that are digital nomads with N nomads. And so we have to adjust and, and, and adapt and evolve in our, in our approaches, whether we are, let's say, instructional designers or video create uh, designers or, um, let's say, working in, in, in circular economy as, as uh, manuf manufacturers. We, we should think of, um, of the agency of the user and how we, we uh, empower them uh, through these soft uh, competencies, um, which practically means that we have to also be <laughs> educated or uh, take up uh, this learning journey, be willing to be shocked ourselves culturally, creatively, and, and expand um, more. Thank you, Stefania. Any other comments or reactions to uh, Stefania's comment, thoughts? If not, there is a question. Uh, Tanya, you can ask the question. Or you can yeah, I have a question for Chiara and Frank related to the development of the Moodle platform. And if in the project is in envisioned that you're doing some testing of the content in the platform with real students, some kind of focus group or like um, user-centered uh, software testing or something like this. Uh, 
yeah, we will be doing that uh, later this summer. Uh, and uh, since it is uh, this Erasmus Plus project, uh, uh, we have kind of number targets of a number of learners. We need to test it with uh, uh, both in a blended format uh, and uh, as an, an only online course. Uh, uh, but uh, we have uh, these targets, uh, which I don't remember at the moment, uh, of number of students we need to reach uh, and test it with. So yeah, it will happen. And it may be interesting just, you know, in the next five minutes that we will probably need to close this discussion um, to go back to Susan's question that I had earlier uh, about, uh, and I think it was for Stefania, but I think it's a broader question. How do we use these online resources? Uh, because in most cases, you know, they require some mediation. We say that we develop all these digital sources and, you know, especially during the current circumstances can work well. They are ideal to educate, um, provide skills, and so on and so forth. So, how do we ensure that these um, resources work for the intended audience? Given that you know this online space is an animal that, in most cases, we're not very familiar with. We have been asked to adapt very quickly. Uh, to a very different environment where there's nobody there to, or there might be somebody there um, to give some direction. So how does this work differently? And Susan, I don't know if you have any follow-up uh, on this. And this could be a, you know, anybody could, could respond to that. Marianne? Yeah, I think <clears throat> one of the things we are learning now, <clears throat> and which might have an uh, impact, uh, um, a, a long term impact also if we stick to it, uh, is that what we can actually do with this is, um, uh, is, is empowering. Uh, students and professionals and uh, not using uh, um, sort of our online learning infrastructures, which at least with a lot of the main, the big uh, um, institutions, be they actually museums or be they uh, um, universities, university colleges, etc., uh, was put in place uh, in a way to monitor and administer, to uh, provide lean processes of pushing something uh, towards students and then kind of ticking off uh, skills uh, afterwards. That you need to actually leave some of these spaces for um, experimenting, uh, for being in a, a sort of... Uh, uh, chaotic uh, face and and uh, teach teach actually <laughs> the students to uh, remain there that goes for us as well in a way that that sort of the the generative space for doing something else with this is also allowing sort of some of the uh, um, faces some of the parts of this to be uh, chaotic in a way to stay with it, to stay with the trouble, in a way, so to say. And I think that's uh, that's really um, uh, that's a learning process. It will take time. Um, I think a lot of what I'm learning with uh, my students now. I have uh, 29 students who uh, um, were doing like mediation or, or dissemination projects of literature into the public with a big literature festival. And they had to do turnarounds very, very quickly in order to actually deliver for exams what they were supposed to deliver. That is either a prototype, which is really good, or <clears throat> actually delivering a project online. Um, and they went into chaos and they came out of it with sort of support uh, and actually created uh, projects. I haven't seen students 
do before with my uh, course in, in, in literature. Um, so it's like, it's, a, it's also creating a kind of resilience for being in these projects uh, and understanding the online environment as not something that is like a heart system uh, um, monitoring environment and an environment where we can fold together. Esther? Yeah, actually responding to what you just said and also relating to um, this idea of when narratives are kind of multi-layered, um, I think that sometimes there's this really singular idea of engaging with either a product or with a story. It's like you read it and then you observe it and then you learn from it. But actually, we're always in a situated space. Uh, we have distractions. We have a lot of different things. And I think from my own experience uh, with my master program is that I also saw students very much engaged with the text, um, but then uh, not really looking at the other same multimodal elements of life, of experience. And I'm doing research now on um, WhatsApp and interactions and information about Sierra Leoneans and how they disseminate information during this lockdown as well. And I really see that there's this really a very layered approach to how people consume information. They would be expressing themselves with four different uh, formats in one message. Um, and it makes also the creation of stories um, let's say more versatile and more online fit, but also the consumption of this. And I think when we start understanding more the relational aspects, say the topologies between information and internet and I don't know, cultural heritage, then um, there, I think that's very interesting insights for um, learning that stays, yeah. Any final comments, thoughts? I just wanted to add one one thing because I think it relates well I found all the presentations very interesting and I can see how there's overlap between uh, what it what each of us does and, um, and individually but also in terms of uh, community and the, the in the context that they are working uh, within so um, just touching about the upon the last uh, point on um, re resilience and I think um, well, I think it relates to Esther's presentation also because uh, importantly, oral traditions and oral histories are quite resilient because I think they, they, they can last through the ages, it seems very important for, uh, especially in cultures where, uh, as you mentioned, uh, let's say museums don't have that much of a dominant, uh, let's say presence or role in, in, in a community or perhaps they live in the sidelines, whereas in Western society, uh, they have a, they, they, they are supposed to safeguard the dominant culture. However, uh, coming back to resiliency, I will say that um, it requires, uh, our, our times requires to be resilient, but as humans uh, and taking the, the biological aspect of it, we are genetically uh, designed, let's say, to be resilient, but what we, we can work on is, our, is on our adaptive capacity and uh, reflexivity. If the reflexivity to be ref, uh, reflective and all for it, and also reflexive in terms of uh, responding to the unknown situations like the ones we experience now. So it's important to look into ourselves, but also in the community, and that's uh, the learning uh, ecological aspect of, and the ecosystems where we work and live in uh, comes in. So this is why I think it's a challenge to have online, uh, let's say, uh, successful online learning, uh, because it's a bit distant and uh, from the actual community, the physical community where we work and live in. Uh, it takes time to adapt and, and, and be able to familiarize with uh, an environment. So, but I think we are, we are very, we're trying to be responsive um, and uh, well, it comes to show this this session and all the series how we are trying to work through it. Thank you. I think with that now. Oh yeah, Peter. One one last comment. Um, uh, 
I'm, so I'm sitting in, at the university, not currently, but basically in Vienna, and the head of our department is from London, so we are quite used uh, for over 10 years to video conferences and so on. Um, but one thing I was surprised positively, and we didn't expect or nobody, uh, I never ran into somebody who said this will be like this and that, uh, is that uh, all the discussions are much more polite on uh, video chat. People are more on time. Nobody cuts each other's word. Uh, and that didn't happen before this for some strange reason. So I hope this sticks because sometimes also the internet is said to be have a little bit of uh, a lot of nasty and weird facets and aspects. So in a way it's nice. Of course, we miss the access to our workshops at the university, so that's that's tricky. And we are lucky with our topic this semester. Doesn't need that much hardware, but uh, yeah, it's tricky. <laughs> Anya, you wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, a, a last comment. I'm interested in what we will take away from this now that everybody has to teach online. So if we can um, take this positive aspect, then also back to the classroom when we go back to the new normal, so to say. Susan, do you have any comment? I see you're unmuted. Uh, no, I, I was going to, but we're, we're very late. No, I, I'm really impressed with all the presentations today and the other days, and I agree with Tanya's comment just now. It, it seems to me that we're all, you know, trying to figure out, and institutions that we work with in the cultural industries, trying to figure out how do we take the lessons that we've learned and reapply them um, as we move forward. So uh, one thing I was going to say, maybe we'll send everybody an email that I was thinking, so many of you are doing such interesting work. If any of you are interested in um, having some of your work feature as a case study in Ignite um, as we move through the uh, production of the, all the courses, um, we would be very interested in speaking to you. So maybe we'll send an email out to all the panelists after this. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you for your participation, for your uh, discussion, not only today, but also in the last three um, uh, sessions. Just to remind you that all presentations will be very soon online on the Teletich YouTube channel. And uh, as Susan said, we will uh, stay in touch both with all the panelists, as well as uh, attendees, whoever is interested in uh, following Ignite, Direct Teach, or other projects. Uh, we have all the uh, means online, Ignite, uh, the, our Twitter channel, and so forth. So you can follow uh, updates. Uh, Tanya, just to, uh, sorry, Anna, just to hand over to you. Yeah, I think this was a very successful um, round, digital roundtable series. And I really like to thank everybody who joined today as well as to previous sessions. A big thank you to our panelists as well that we have here today and that we have had in the other sessions. And I'd like to wrap it up now. And for those who are still with us, I'm uh, again sharing my screen here. And I'd like to point you out to the Daria Teach YouTube channels. So all uh, sessions have been recorded. We will do some post editing and then you will be able to find all of the sessions on the Daria Teach YouTube channel. We're trying to get the presentation slides as well and link them then to the info box on YouTube. Um, I'd like to point you out to our uh, project website, which is ignite.acdh.oeav.ac.at. Um, there you can find out more. And yeah, I think we improvised really, really well. Unfortunately, we didn't have the pleasure to see each other face to face, but I think 
this was a real nice improvisation we did and thank you so much. Thank you.